Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The meeting will come to order. The clerk will note the roll. There is a quorum. Uh, members, sorry about the delay in starting. I really uh, hate starting late, but I uh, had a couple of uh, delays, including uh, wanting to make sure we had uh, some copies of things out to members. Um, members, uh, just as a, um, a reminder, we're going to have the Ways and Means meeting convening at 1 o'clock on Monday. Uh, the plan will be to take up the higher education bill and the public safety bill. And uh, the 24-hour rule will be in effect for that. The amendments uh, would be due at uh, 5 o'clock uh, tonight. Um, if uh, members have got a problem with that, I guess uh, uh, let me know. But uh, we should be able to uh, have the 24-hour rule for, for those bills. Uh, Representative Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, you also have listed in addition to the bills um, the budget resolution. Uh, yes, sir. And. Uh, uh, at least when uh, you and I talked this morning, uh, those numbers weren't yet put together. Will the numbers be posted? Uh, or maybe they are. I've been busy until this meeting started. But uh, if, and I don't know that we have any plans for an amendment to the budget resolution, but if we did, when will that be posted relative to the um, 5 o'clock uh, deadline for amendments then? Well, we would be planning on posting it at uh, 5 o'clock today, Representative Carlson. But if you, uh, we will be taking up the budget resolution. If you have some uh, changes that you'd like to suggest to the budget resolution, of course, uh, those will be in order. At 5 o'clock tonight. Well, by Don't 5 o'clock we tonight. Five. Yeah, Representative Kahn. Well, Mr. Chairman, if an amendment goes in at 5, don't we have some period after that to do amendments to the amendment? Uh, we don't have an amendment to the amendment rule in committee, Representative Kahn. So that means that any amendment to the amendment is okay. Uh, Representative Kahn, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I, and I, you know, we haven't talked yeah. about the budget resolution for uh, Monday uh, as a uh, group from our side, the aisle, and I just wanted to make sure that if, you know, and, and I don't know that we have anything on the planning board, but if we did, uh, that there would be that opportunity <laughs> to... Uh, respond in some way if we chose to. So you're telling yeah. me that an amendment to the amendment would be in order right up through Monday then, apparently? Uh, yes, Representative Carlson, it would be. And if, and if we if something does develop, uh, we'd try to give you a heads up. Um, I don't know if the members on my side know yet, but uh, we did put notice out that we're going to try to um, get together Monday morning and talk about the two bills that are up. Sure. So uh, that won't be a conversation until Monday morning because things are breaking rather fast so uh, we'll be doing that uh, but uh, we would if we did have an amendment let you know as soon as we could okay yeah and members I guess so you know we want to for the sake of the public be able to post amendments early if we can uh, as we get into this next week when we've got all sorts of bill referrals happening I'm guessing most of the time the 24-hour amendment won't be in order just because of the uh, the uh, timing of the bills that we're going to be getting uh, off the floor as they're referred from other committees. Uh, but we want to be able to give the public notice when we can. And so I guess in this case, I think uh, with us not the meeting until 1 o'clock on Monday, uh, we certainly would be able to uh, allow the public to have 24 hours notice on, on those bills. Uh, Representative yeah. Mahoney. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I have two questions. I didn't bring the hearing aids today, so I wanted to check. You said what time are we meeting on Monday? A uh, one o'clock. One o'clock. Yep. Uh, sessions at eleven. Um, I guess I figured that gives everyone uh, time to have lunch after session before we go in. And, and then, Mr. Chair, uh, as I was looking on the website today, you had posted for a while the A72 amendment, then it came down. So has the A72 amendment been pulled? Um, uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hillsborough. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In addition, um, posted on the website, it does say that we're meeting at 1130, but it also says that uh, Representative Cornish's public safety bill will be heard on Monday as well. So is it your, not your intention to hear that bill either? Well, I think I did say public safety and higher education okay. on Monday, didn't I? I, 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 I mean, misheard. Mean, that's what okay. All right. Yes. Uh, public safety and higher education on Monday. Those are the two bills, uh, plus a change in the budget resolution that we'll be hearing on Monday. And the 5 o'clock deadline for all amendments are for all of those items? Uh, yes. Other questions? All right. Um, 
Members, I've got the minutes of um, April 16th in front of us. Uh, would someone like to move the minutes? Representative Carlson moves the minutes. Are there any corrections, additions, changes to the minutes? See none. All in favor, <laughs> signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Uh, members, we've got the uh, budget resolution. We've got House File 606. I think uh, maybe in deference to um, Representative Keel, who uh, I assume is uh, going home this weekend and has a long drive home, maybe we'll take up uh, her bill right now since she's here instead of doing the budget resolution. Um, so, members, I will move that House File 606 be referred to the General Register. And uh, Representative Keel, I know you've got a couple of uh, amendments here, the A6 and the A7 amendment. Uh, do you want to explain your bill first, or would you like to uh, have me move those amendments? A um, uh, little bit. Uh, can we explain the bill real quickly and then move sure. the two amendments? All right. Please uh, explain the bill, Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Uh, members, uh, House File 606 is intended to achieve a safety standard that we seek for our uh, uh, similar to our outpatient surgical centers. <laughs> Women seeking help for abortion expect to find a safe and comforting place when life has taken a turn that they are not able to handle on their own. <clears throat> looking for advice first to confirm a pregnancy and then to lo looking to terminate a pregnancy. They seek out to help from from a seek out help from an abortion facility already stressed and emotional. These women and young girls assume that this facility has been licensed by our state. We are here to talk today about the um, uh, ability to license an abortion facility that would provide 10 or more abortions each month. Um, and with that, um, Mr. Chair, uh, I would like to move the two amendments. Well, Representative Keel, I should say, first of all, welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. I don't think you've uh, been before us before. But um, no, I have not. <laughs> uh, Representative Keel, why don't I move the A7 amendment first? That uh, I guess, and perhaps you can explain the A7 amendment. Yes, Mr. Chair, I can. Um, uh, members, uh, we would be uh, removing the uh, a requirement uh, for uh, a facility to uh, um, that doesn't obtain a license to. Uh, uh, remove the misdemeanor and then also the fine of $300. And that's what that consists of. Okay, okay so this uh, removes the uh, fine. Uh, members, is there discussion to the A7 amendment? See no discussion. All in favor of the A7 amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Here. <coughs> Motion prevails. The A7 amendment is adopted. Okay. Members, now we've got the A6 it's amendment. Chair will move the A6 amendment. Uh, Representative Keel, can you explain the A6 amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if uh, Mr. Marks would uh, explain the changes here. All right. I guess it is a uh, money type issue. Mr. Marks, can I have you uh, explain the changes in the A6 amendment? Mr. Chair, members, the, the A6 simply takes the appropriation, uh, well, the, the appropriation currently in the bill is 63000 in fiscal 16 only. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, program, and so the, there needs to be appropriations in each year. Uh, the A6 takes the appropriation, uh, splits it between the two years, and adds a thousand to it to make it even. Um, and then, and so essentially, that's it. Uh, it's 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 uh, appropriating 64,000, 32,000 in each year. This also establishes then a base in future years. All right, members. Uh, any discussion to the A6 amendment? Uh, Representative Liebling. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I wonder, Mr. Marks, if you could just explain. As I was looking at the amendment, I thought um, that it didn't put a base in for future <coughs> years. Could you just explain that a little bit? So, um, obviously, if this bill was to become law, this is a program that would have to be funded year after year after year, right? And um, I, I'm just not understanding how the amendment does that. Mr. Marks. Mr. Chair, Representative Liebling, there's language in Chapter 16A that says that the base for future years is the appropriation in the second year of the biennium. So by putting an appropriation in fiscal year 2017, that will become the base for fiscal 18 and 19. Uh, so that's how it, it, it's current law that achieves that by putting an appropriation uh -huh. in fiscal 17. Thank you. 
Representative Carlson, had you had your hand up? Um, I, I'll just, I, I did have another question, but I'll <laughs> wait on that one. But I assume then this is coming out of the other bills category. Uh, Representative Carlson, and, yes. And um, Although, actually, this is a special revenue fund, excuse me. Oh, this isn't general fund. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. so this wouldn't have any impact on that. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all in favor of the A6 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Motion prevails. The A6 amendment is adopted. <clears throat> okay, members, discussion to House File 606 as amended. Representative Kahn. Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman and Representative Keel, I have a question about how w one specific line on this would be um, would be defined, and then I might give you a particular example, and that's um, uh, line 2.16. After I hear your uh, um, your explanation of it, I might ask for some further comment. Representative Peel. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Kahn, um, <clears throat> how I would see conduct or practices detrimental to the welfare of, of the patient would be uh, in, in terms of uh, not having um, uh, having a medical procedure done and not having a medical medical personnel there, um, you know, uh, assistant. It probably wouldn't be the doctor that would be doing it, but it might be a nurse that would be assisting if they would have somebody in administration show up and help because they're lacking people. Um, uh, that could be detrimental to the patient. Also making sure that they are... Um, um, uh, in, in, in prepared to go home to make sure that they've, uh, you know, informed them on what they need to know uh, when leaving. Just like we would if we were going to uh, outpatient surgical and we we're reviewing all the information we needed um, before we went home after a procedure. Representative Kahn? I guess what I was interested in is what if the decision, for example, um, what if the dis oh. All right. the thing I'm specifically interested in is what if the decision <coughs> not to do an abortion um, means that the person can no longer bear any children in the future? Is that considered to be a practice detrimental to the welfare of the patient? Representative Keel. Um, did I explain it again to me? Representative just, Kahn. The decision is made for various reasons um, not to do an abortion. Mm -hmm. And that decision results in the woman being unable to bear children at any time in the future. Is, the, uh, is um, that considered a decision that's detrimental or a practice detrimental to the welfare of the patient? I would think that that was something that she would be discussing with a physician and, and they would sign off on. I mean, I, you, you, that's not something you would know until later on. So, no, I, I don't, you know, and, and I should say also that this language is taken from the wording for the licensure for outpatient surgical centers. Okay, I guess the answer is you don't know. Okay, Representative Liebling. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, I've had the pleasure of hearing this bill now, I think for the third time, mm -hmm. and it has not improved. Um, this bill, I think, is just simply plays politics with women's lives and their health. It is really not about health. Um, first of all, it, has, uh, it only applies to a clinic that does 10 or more abortions a month. And that's an arbitrary <laughs> limit. So um, if this was really about health, why would we have such a limit? Um, and I don't know, maybe Representative Keel will want to address that later. It's really a rhetorical question. It doesn't make any sense. If they're doing nine, surely the women are as entitled to have a safe facility as if they're doing 10 or more. So, so there's that right there. Secondly, I think it's very clear um, what would happen under this bill. Um, these um, imposing the licensing of an outpatient surgical center imposes a lot of things that really 
um, are very expensive for clinics to, um, to change and that really don't relate to the women's health in these circumstances and would result in possibly closing four out of the five clinics that do abortions in Minnesota. The result of that is sending desperate women back to back alley abortions, things like sepsis, and perhaps to death. So when you close the safe facilities that have a great track record in Minnesota, and by the way, this is a very safe procedure, you are putting women's lives and health in great danger. Now, let's be clear, an outpatient surgical center um, is a lot of things are done in clinics in Minnesota that you would consider surgical. Um, doing uh, most abortions are not surgical, but things like vasectomies, tubal ligation, dental surgery, and even amputations can be done in clinics in Minnesota that are not licensed as outpatient surgical centers. So this is not about health. If this was really about needing to increase the, increase the licensing and, in, and change the facilities for health, why in the world would you not do that for places that are doing vasectomies, tubal ligation, and dental surgery? This is not about health. The MMA says that this is not about health. And I would just like to read a paragraph from their letter. They say, the MMA is unaware, this is the Minnesota Medical Association, is unaware of any specific evidence in Minnesota of substandard care in clinics that provide pregnancy termination services. Likewise, the MMA is not convinced that patient safety is advanced in any meaningful way as a result of the licensing requirements established in this legislation. Finally, the MMA is concerned that the adoption of this legislation could interfere with the provision of care for pregnant women. So I think it's very clear, members, that, I mean, everybody knows how they vote on these abortion bills. This is just a run-of-the-mill anti-abortion bill. If you want to vote for it, to just send a message about how anti-abortion you are, that's one thing. But no one really should be saying with a straight face that this is to protect women's health because it isn't. It's simply about abortion politics. And in fact, it places women's lives and health in danger. Representative Wagenius. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Keel, if this bill were to become law, it's 100 percent certain that uh, there would be a lawsuit and that the state would have to defend that lawsuit. I mean, there are two obvious uh, theories or, or reasons to do a lawsuit. One is the denial of equal protection, and, and I won't go over that because <laughs> Representative Liebling just did, and then the undue burden on women. And she went over that too. <coughs> but my question is, since it's 100% certain that there would be a lawsuit, why do you not have the money in here to fund the defense of your bill? A Representative Keel. My question would be, um, do we make that presumption on other bills that if we think there's going to be a lawsuit, we provide the funding for a lawsuit? <coughs> I'm not, I don't know. I'm asking. Representative Wagenius. Oftentimes, there is a question that there might be a lawsuit, but there isn't any question here. There will be a lawsuit. It always happens when bills like this come up. That's 100% certainty. So I'm asking why you didn't include money to defend the very uh, provisions you're trying to put in law. Okay. Representative Keel. Um, because I don't, I, I guess that's not something I would see happening. I'm, I'm not sure that it would be 100%. I mean, that's, that's a guess and um, I wouldn't. I didn't recognize that it would be a hundred percent for certain. So. Uh, members, I should mention that uh, while there isn't a money uh, for defending a lawsuit in the bill, and I'm not sure that that's a, a normal occurrence that we have. The fiscal note does assume 
uh, that uh, there will be one appeals hearing every two years with the Office of Administrative Hearings. And so there is uh, money in the bill uh, to contemplate a <coughs> hearing on perhaps a license challenge or something at that level. Uh, Representative Wiginius. That's entirely different uh, than a lawsuit challenging the bill itself. And it, that's challenging the licensure, which would, of course, go uh, through the Administrative Procedures Act. This would go to our judicial system. And <coughs> Representative Keel, I, I find it. Um, yeah, and Representative Oginius, I was not saying that that was the same. In fact, I think I specifically said it was not the same at the beginning of my comments. I just wanted to, since we are talking about finances here and we were, I guess, in general talking about potential challenges, I wanted to bring people's attention to uh, something related to that being in the bill. But uh, I, I guess I don't see any money put aside in the fiscal note for lawsuits, although I'm not aware of that being a regular thing that uh, we put in the bills. I think that that's something that the Attorney General has their budget for to defend us uh, if that in fact happens with bills that we pass. But uh, Representative Weenius, go ahead. I had just wanted to, I didn't mean to get into the middle of your discussion with Representative Keel. I just wanted to uh, point that out in the fiscal note. But go ahead, Representative Weenius. Well, well, you <laughs> You bring up an interesting issue. You're saying that the, this would be defended by the Attorney General, yet you're cutting the Attorney General's budget and something that's going to be 100% certain that there would be a lawsuit on it. You would think that you'd provide money to defend it. And I'm just pointing out that the, I think the fiscal note is not accurate. And uh, it's just I'm, I'm pointing it out. I'm, I think it's strange that you don't want to defend your bill. So most my comments. All right. Um, Representative Hornstein. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Keel, it's my understanding that um, these are uh, designated as physician clinics and they're regulated under the physician licensure rules that are already in place from the Board of Medical Practice. And uh, furthermore, um, you know, there are pretty rigorous standards. Uh, from the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Association, HIPAA, OSHA. Um, so these are already very, very highly regulated <laughs> institutions. As Representative Liebling pointed out, they have a very, very strong track record. So, like, is this, I, I just don't understand why we would just be adding more uh, regulation for something that's already very highly regulated, both at the state level and the federal level. Um, can you comment on that? Representative Keel. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative, um, <clears throat> excuse me. First of all, abortion clinics are not, abortion facilities are not um, licensed. And uh, outpatient surgical centers um, have conditions of licensure, and that's the comparison. Uh, co conditions of, uh, of licensure for outpatient surgical centers must provide nursing care. This is right out of the statute. And uh, not, not, um, but not limited to the Association of Operating Room Nurses and American Nurses Association standards. Um, and they have to, f they, that's part of the licensure. And um, <coughs> there's also other requirements within the surgical center that um, uh, we're asking for um, them to be. Abortion uh, facilities are, are really kind of outside of uh, medical care uh, observation as opposed to most most of the uh, well and and of all the outpatient surgical centers that we have Representative Hornstein well thank you mr. I'm, I'm just not I'm struggling with that because that seems to uh, you know contradict the fact that um, you know these practices are regulated by the Board of Medical Practice and the Board of Nurses so I, I think they are included but um, you know this seems like a so uh, a solution in search of a problem. I mean, I, I don't think we need this, and I would encourage members to vote no. Representative Liebling, did you have another question? I did, Mr. Chair, and um, there was a discussion earlier about lawsuits and potential lawsuits, and I just uh, wanted to point out to members that this bill has a severability clause, 
And uh, maybe I could just ask Representative Keel to explain if she, if it's not expected that this bill is going to be challenged in court, why have a severability clause? Uh, Representative Keel. I think you're looking at uh, <coughs> page two, line 33. Is 33. that correct? Uh, That's right, Representative Mr. Chair. Leeling. Yes, yeah, subdivision six of the bill. Okay. <coughs> Um, Representative Keel. I believe that's yeah. part of the uh, uh, the bill and the protections for the and and um, I suppose there is a risk of it, so it's put in. My guess is it would be put in for other bills also. Well, Representative Liebling. Well, Mr. Chair, thank you. And I don't see this usually. I mean, it's very rare to see a severability clause in a bill unless it's an abortion bill. <clears throat> And unless uh, people are trying to do something that they know the courts have frowned upon before and they want to, um, and they, they know that it's going to be challenged. So I think there is a little um, conflict in what you're saying, Representative Keel. And, and I think when you have a severability clause in a bill, you are expecting that somebody's going to challenge it. This, this well, same policy has mm -hmm. been challenged in other places. I don't have the data in front of me, but I believe there have been, um, it has been found unconstitutional and overturned in some places, maybe upheld in some other places. So um, this is definitely an issue that is going to be challenged if it would become law. And so, um, well, I guess I would just ask uh, Representative Keel, I'm, I'm not really clear on your position on this. Are you expecting that it would not be challenged in court? Representative Keel. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that can be challenged in court. Um, it, it, there's a possibility, sure. Um, however, uh, I find it ironic that I hear all the time about how safe abortion facilities are. I hear the number 99%. Um, and you're telling me it's so safe we don't need to license it. However, you're questioning we're going to have lawsuits right off the bat. We're going to have people challenging. If it is that safe, then they should have no that's, concerns. That's not where the lawsuit will be. Well, Representative Liebling. Well, Mr. Chair, I mean, that, that just makes no sense to me, Representative Keel, what you just said. The problem is that by forcing them to be licensed to a different standard, they will close because they will be unable to afford to meet the new standards. Therefore, they will not be there to serve the women they now serve. That's the problem with the bill. So that is why your bill puts women's lives and health in danger, because they will not have a safe facility that they have now. They will be pushed back out to back alley abortions, which are terribly dangerous, where women used to bleed to death and lose their lives and lose their fertility, because they, desperate women will always get abortions. And by making abortion illegal, you would not stop it as it was not stopped before Roe v. Wade. Women used to die trying to get abortions because some women will be desperate and will go that route. And so what we have now, much as some people don't like women making their own decisions with regard to this, and as, as much as some politicians would like to interfere in the private lives of women and not allow them to make their own decisions, at least there are safe facilities available for those women who want to do so. And what your bill does is close down those facilities and push women back out into the street to find an abortion the best they can. That is what it does. So um, my question to you, though, is if you don't think that this is going to be challenged, this is why it would be challenged, because you are closing down women's legal access to abortion in a safe setting. That is what you are doing here. And so naturally, if this would become law in Minnesota, it would be challenged. I just can't imagine how it wouldn't be. If you don't think that would be the case, then you shouldn't have a severability clause in this bill. A Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'd just like to respond to a question that uh, Representative Hornstein had. Uh, regarding this uh, and the comparison between an outpatient surgical procedure which you might go to for let's say an orthoscopic knee surgery uh, where you would have an invasive procedure with anesthesia uh, that would require have a certain set of requirements that would have uh, standards for cleanliness standards for patient uh, prep and uh, post-op care 
uh, so that you can have uh, the procedure and be taken home and be uh, in a, in a uh, protected manner, <coughs> sanctioned by the state of Minnesota. Uh, the majority of abortions that are performed in Minnesota are an invasive surgical procedure. They are coded and billed as such. Uh, where there is a significant uh, risk for uh, infection and blood loss uh, and hemorrhage. Uh, and aftercare is very, very important. Uh, Representative Keel's bill just simply uh, seeks to put the same standards for medical care and cleanliness and patient care uh, to protect folks as you would have if you were going to uh, get your knee fixed at an orthoscopic, uh, an orthoscopic surgery at an outpatient surgical center. Uh, that's the comparison. Uh, so I, I don't understand why there would be a necessity that these, pa these uh, clinics could not uh, adhere to the same, uh, the same standards, the same health standards uh, that other outpatient surgical centers do for, quite frankly, less dangerous procedures. Uh, <clears throat> Representative Hornstein, since your name was mentioned, yeah, I'll just, go to you. <laughs> just very quickly, I, I mean, I think it's important for the record, and I, th I think uh, uh, Representative Liebling uh, referred to this. I mean, the American Medical Association, American Co uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists oppose these bills, and you know they're they're the physicians. They're they're the ones that you know took an oath to protect the lives of their patients. That's their job, and I think it, it you know the problem with this uh, this bill and, and others that are similar is that you know when when <laughs> politicians try to play doctor, I think it it we run into trouble, and that's what's going on here. So. You know, I'm going to trust the physicians who, uh, you know, that's their job. They, 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 the patients, their patients' care uh, is a absolutely primary for them, and, and they oppose this. So um, I, I think it's, 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 it's dangerous for us to, to get between the patient-doctor relationship and to play doctor. Uh, Representative Hillstrom, then Cornish. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the author, can you tell me why this didn't go to the Civil Law Committee? Because you are um, determining the standard of proof. You are uh, laying out what the um, hearing is supposed to look like for any suspension, revocation, and refusal um, to renew the license. Um, you have the severability clause. And I see, looking at the list, that it did not go to the Civil Law Committee. And the Civil Law Committee hears all of these bills. Representative Keel. Um, I wasn't aware that it needed to go there, and um, there was no recommendation that it should go there. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hillstrom, is there language relating to, what is it, uh, s Chapter 13 on here that you see? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have not seen uh, Chapter 13, but I do um, have a a page 2 or line 2.22 uh, where it talks about the hearing and it talks about the burden and who has it and what it is. Those kinds of bills always go to <coughs> civil law. Mr. Chair, I was originally going to raise the issue that it should have gone to public safety as well, but she took out the provision that concerned me about public safety, and so I don't think that it's appropriate to have gone there. But um, these are the kinds of bills that we always hear in civil law. When you're talking about who has the burden to prove <coughs> what and what the civil process is to suspend someone's license or take it, those are all the issues that we always send to civil law, and that's where it should appropriately go. Representative Cornish. Um, Mr. Chair, Member, I'm sorry to have to dice up the meeting a little here, but I have to respond to your typical liberal <coughs> diatribe garbage that I hear. Um, and I don't mean that from any certain member here, so it's not an insult, but whenever <laughs> this, whenever this <laughs> subject, whenever this subject comes up, we hear the drama come out about back uh, yard abortions, car abortions, coat hanger abortions. And if these people had just one bit of sympathy as they do for the mother or they do the baby that's being aborted, the millions of kids that have died, it's just unbelievable. I adopted my first son and thank God that uh, his mother was mentally challenged, living with the grandparents and poor. She fit all the qualifications that your typical abortion people would walk up to and say, you need an abortion. It'd be a good idea for abortion. This kid's going to end up in welfare or crime. You should abort the kid and live your life and get an education. And uh, they could have told her that. And very easily she could have made that decision. But she didn't. And now I've got a son that has given me five kids, and I'm proud of every one of them. 
and I got 12 grandchildren. I think of all the grandchildren that would be here today if we weren't killing them. And to call one of these centers safe, there's nothing safe about any of these centers. There's always a, a risk. You go in anywhere. You go to a hospital, you better stand out of them. If you weren't sick when you went into them, you'll be sick when you go out. But, so there's always a risk. And the lawsuits, I feel bad for the mothers would probably want to sue the doctor that performed the abortion when she was a young mother. And she grows up and wishes to God she hadn't got that abortion and, and is sorry for it every day. And you see them all over. And that's why we have the counseling before we go in. So I just wanted to give you the conservative side of the argument. If we have to live with abortion, we do. Roe versus Wade, now we got to live with the horror of abortion. But at least we can make it as safe as we possibly can if we're going to have to live with the horror of it. So that's it. Okay, I've uh, got Representative yeah. Carlson, Hillstrom, and Liebling. Representative Carlson. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> why don't I uh, yield to uh, one of the others first? My, my question and wait a bit. Mr. Chair. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, But I'd Mr. like Chair. to remain on the list. Representative Keel, my... my my serious question was, why didn't it go to civil law, and why won't you just send it back to civil law right now so that they can actually look at whether or not it's the proper burden, who has that burden, what it should be, and whether or not it meets all the criteria that we do when we set up any other civil process, because that's what this is in the bill. Representative Keel. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Hillstrom. Uh, my understanding is, and it's probably not a simple or a, a good answer, but... Um, this bill is similar to the previous abortion licensure bill, and I don't believe it was requested to go to those committees. So, um, uh, and it wasn't recommended. So, Mr. Chair. Well, Representative, Representative Hillstrom, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, Representative Keel, at this point, I'm not going to make a motion to send it back, but I'm certainly going to talk to Representative Scott because it really is within the jurisdiction of the committee, and she should hear it. And she's having a hearing next week, and so there isn't any reason she can't hear it. Representative Liebling. Or Representative Carlson, did you want to step in now? or do you want No, I'll, I'll wait. So. Okay, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I won't repeat and echo and get involved in the insults from Representative Cornish that I just think are... You know, there's no need to sink to that level. But I just do want to point out that this, is, this bill is put forward and is always put forward as being about women's safety. And clearly it isn't. And we just heard it, why. We just heard that it isn't. And I just want to say that it's, it's really about politicians telling women how they should make their decisions. And I, Representative, uh, well, I won't even mention your name, but uh, just to say that... Um, uh, women should not be pushed to have abortions, but at the same time, when they decide that they need to have one, they should not have politicians step in and make it more dangerous and more expensive and more difficult for them to do so. Because there's um, this law, this bill would close the only Minnesota abortion clinic in greater Minnesota. And when you make it hard for women to get to a place where they can get a safe abortion, it means they're going to wait longer in many cases, which makes it more difficult, more dangerous, and more expensive. So again, this is a bill that is not about women's safety. It just isn't. It's about abortion politics. So everybody's going to vote on this bill, if, uh, or those of you who want to stop women from having abortions are going to vote for this bill, but just know this bill does not protect women's health. It may, pre it may prevent some women from having a safe and legal abortion, but it d is not about protecting their health. It's just the opposite. It makes it more dangerous, more expensive for women to get a, a legal abortion. Representative Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I had a uh, question of um, perhaps uh, staff, and this is a follow-up to uh, Representative Wagenius's uh, question because if you followed this issue and legislation like this, I don't know if this is identical in some other states, been challenged in the courts. And uh, those court cases are very expensive. And as some of you may know, I so serve on uh, state government finance uh, committee chaired by Representative Anderson. Um, I don't have those numbers with me here today uh, because I wasn't realizing we were going to get into a discussion of the Attorney General's office. But uh, my recollection is that uh, in the bill, uh, there is a significant reduction to the uh, Attorney General's budget. 
And so my question, I don't know if Mr. Marks would have that information with him or if uh, maybe Representative Anderson uh, remembers uh, a lot of numbers in the bill. So if she doesn't, I wouldn't uh, falter for that. But what the reduction was to the Attorney General's office, because this is the type of case that would probably, with both sides of the issue uh, engaged, go all the way to the uh, Supreme Court. And I agree with Representative Wagenius. I think there's a... If you look at what's happened in other states, the high degree of likelihood that it will be challenged on constitutional grounds. Uh, well, let's see. So maybe if one of the two would, would have that. Uh, either Mr. Marks or Representative Anderson, do either of you know the uh, uh, the number for Attorney General? Okay, Representative, I guess they don't have it at the moment, Representative Carlson. Uh, Representative Anderson is attempting to find it. Okay, I don't know if others had questions, but if they find it before we vote, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. All right, okay. Uh, any other questions on the bill as amended? Uh, well, uh, members, I guess we don't have that information. Perhaps we can uh, provide it to you after the meeting, Representative um, Carlson. Or, yeah, well, Mr. you can Chairman, get it I, well, I've got it on my desk in my own office. I uh, have the numbers from the other night when we passed out the state government finance bill. Uh, so if they don't have it at their fingertips, I can get that on my, my own. But uh, okay. uh, I think it's probably a question that if the uh, bill is voted out here today that uh, probably should be part of the discussion on the House floor. Um, when you go all the way to the uh, Supreme Court, whether it's state or federal, those are very expensive uh, court cases. And for those of you that don't follow the... Uh, Attorney General's uh, role in the audience, I think all the members here would know, but the role of the Attorney General is to defend a state law that is passed. That's a, a requirement that they have. And so uh, if it is challenged, they would have to um, defend it. And um, I think it would be very seldom that they would ever be in a situation where they wouldn't, but um, I'm not a history person on every court case, but I think that's the general rule at least. There's a couple of attorneys on the committee that can say whether I'm right or wrong on that, but I think that's the role that they have to defend. <clears throat> so uh, if we could get those numbers, uh, or I'll get them before the House floor, then if, if they're not available now before you vote. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Cornish. Um, I think we've had several ability clauses before, threats of lawsuits before. We've had, I think, our gun bill that we passed on the, sa the same subject went to court, was ruled unconstitutional, came back, and the, the Attorney General defended it then. And we didn't add any money or anything special to the bill. Everything worked out okay, so I don't see the big problem with this whole issue of the Attorney General's separability or lawsuits. <coughs> Well, members, uh, see no further discussion, the chair will renew his motion that House File 606, as amended, be referred to the General Register. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Uh, motion prevails. House File 606, as amended, is referred to the General Register. Thank you, Representative Keel. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, members, uh, next I'm going to take up the uh, budget resolution. And members, we had a uh, separate handout that came later of the uh, budget res resolution as it exists now. And so uh, you should have that um, oh, that shows as it was adopted and then amended on April 13th. You should have that in front of you. And members, I'm going to move the A21 amendment to the budget resolution. Uh, Representative Carl. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I might ask a question that is not directly related, uh, but will be as you move to the uh, next bill with, with what you're doing. Uh, was this bill uh, certified when it was reported out of committee as being within its target? When it moved out of the Jobs Committee, Representative Carlson? Yeah. Uh, the reason I'm asking... It was within its target. Yeah. It was, yeah, Representative Carlson, it was within its target, Mr. Marks tells me. Well, I guess I had believed that. Uh, it would appear that way, but uh, maybe I can ask, being that you're going to be having an amendment dealing with this very section, uh, <clears throat> it says the uh, target here, when I look at the spreadsheet, 330900000 and that's what's in the budget resolution, but then there's also, it says general fund 
impact below that of 1.57 million. 1,570,000, and I'm just trying to see how those numbers interact with uh, the bill being certified because that may impact on what you want to do with the uh, budget resolution if if I'm following your other amendments that you want to do uh, once the bill is before us. So was it, are we calculating that 1.5 and is it? Representative Carlson, it if you're looking at the spreadsheet, the, the spreadsheet is uh, assuming that the amendments are adopted. Uh, maybe I can refer to Mr. Marks. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, members, the, the tracking sheet for the jobs bill, the top line says, with amendment A69, uh, that was an author's amendment, and, and it's a fairly, it moves money around in a number of places, and we thought it would be better to have the spreadsheet here that actually showed where the money moved around. So the, the spreadsheet that's in the folder has the author's amendment. It doesn't have the other amendment relating to broadband built into it. So. So the spreadsheet reflects, it is showing 1570. That amount is included in this amendment, but, uh, or is included in the amendment to the budget resolution. Uh, but we were trying to have a spreadsheet that would be helpful, that would actually show what the bill looked like with the author's amendment included in it. Okay, Mr. Chairman, and that Carlson. answers the question, uh, because House Rules would provide that when it leaves committee, it has to be, uh, certified as being within its target and uh, as we all know it's the spreadsheet that is the certification if I recall um, okay so uh, that's the uh, difference uh, then um, that 1.57 plus the broadband will be uh, part of the uh, budget resolution change that's why I was asking the question before we voted thank you sure. yeah no thank you for bringing that issue up and uh, clarifying that representative Carlson so yeah members what this would do in total is this would add nine million five hundred seventy thousand dollars to the target for the uh, jobs bill house file 843 that's before us and uh, it consists of the one million five hundred seventy thousand that's in the spreadsheet with the author's amendment uh, which we'll be taking up later, obviously, and then anticipating another amendment dealing with $8 million. But this particular amendment to the budget resolution merely increases the uh, target for the jobs committee by 9,570,000. So there is there a discussion to that amendment to the budget resolution? Mr. Representative Mr. Carlson. Chairman, just a quick comment. Uh, I'm pleased that you're moving in the direction that we tried to get you to move when the budget resolution was adopted. Uh, well, Representative Carlson, when we uh, adopted the original budget resolution, we left some $300 million on the bottom line. I know that was a little bit unprecedented, but uh, we did that because, uh, uh, you know, I guess it's been my experience, and I know yours over the years, and probably just about everyone's in this room who's a member, that uh, oftentimes fiscal notes move around, and you also learn new things as you're having <laughs> further hearings about uh, needs that may take place. Uh, you look at the agriculture committee and what's happening there right now with the outbreak of avian flu. We were going to bring up that bill uh, earlier this week, but uh, given the emergency situation and the rapidly evolving things that are happening there, we felt it was uh, wise to uh, wait another week as they were having a hearing themselves on Thursday so we could uh, determine just exactly what the best response would be. And I would anticipate that when we do bring up the agriculture bill that there will be some additional money. We'll be asking people to put into the target for the agriculture bill to deal with that uh, emergency. Uh, Representative Carlson. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chairman, I, and I was serious with my comment earlier, but I, I think you summed it up uh, in the concern we had at the time, uh, uh, because we always left uh, money on the bottom line for the very reasons that you cite, but uh, when you said that $330 million was unprecedented, uh, that, that was our concern that, uh, that night that uh, there were just going to be some very tough targets and that something was going to have to be done uh, at some point. And um, I actually had some compassion for you because I felt some of your chairs would be beating on your door. And I think that's maybe what we're seeing happening here. But thank you. Well, my chairs are great chairs. Uh, but uh, I didn't mean that they weren't. I just know that uh, they were under some stress. Mr. Chairman? Well, Representative Davids. I didn't beat on your door. I just picked your lock. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Mahoney. Uh, and Mr. Chair and, and to Representative Carlson, I have a sneaky suspicion that the chair of 
this next, the author of this next bill was not beating on his door from comments that he made in committee. I thought he was pretty happy with this bill. Other discussion to the uh, budget resolution 821 amendment. Uh, seeing no discussion, uh, the chair will renew his motion to adopt the A21 amendment to the budget resolution. All in favor <coughs> say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The A21 amendment is adopted. Members, uh, uh, Chair Garofalo, who is the author of the uh, next bill, uh, isn't in the room at the moment and uh, apparently uh, is uh, temporarily delayed. And so I'm going to call a recess of the committee till 1.30. Mr. Chairman of the Wild Plain? Uh, they did last night. I don't think they are right now, Representative Carlson. Uh, he, was probably, he was probably attired when I saw him earlier today. That's why I was wondering. Yeah. All right, uh, members, we are recessed uh, <laughs> till 1.30. <laughs>